All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is Saturday, the 29th of October, in the year of our Lord, 2022. And we're still all here. Huh. <laughs> Wishful thinking on my part. Maybe I should be a preterist and I could believe the rapture's already happened. <laughs> I don't think so. That would be a little difficult. I think we would be aware of some changes if that had been the case. If Christ had actually returned in 70 A.D., you, you would suspect that, that the church might have been aware of that, wouldn't you? Oh, of course not. Uh, you know, that's not the only uh, weird thing. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventists and the Jehovah's Witnesses, which were basically an offshoot in some ways, had this idea that Christ secretly came. It has to do with... Uh, well, back about the year 1850-ish, there was a Baptist minister who had done some calculations and had convinced himself, and then he convinced others, that Christ would come back at a certain date, particular date, even though Jesus said no man knows the day or the hour. Well, there's always people that don't believe that that's, that they think they're above that. No man... That somehow they can figure it out. Uh, but, uh, and they're always proven wrong, so far at least. But uh, anyway, so this Baptist minister began preaching this and convinced a bunch of people. And uh, we've had this uh, happen not too many years ago with a guy from California, uh, Family Radio, something camping or camping, the name, uh, was the last name, I believe. And he convinced a lot of people of exactly the same thing that happened back in the 1800s, where people were selling their property, uh, giving stuff away, everything, because they were absolutely convinced the Lord was going to come at a certain date. Happened back in the mid-1800s. Uh, Baptist minister convinced all these people, had a whole bunch of calculations, just like this other guy camping. I think that was his last name. Family radio network, so he had a big audience. Uh, and eventually he had a, uh, a brain hemorrhage or something. Apparently God shut his mouth <laughs> after he did it repeatedly. He got the date wrong, so he's recalculated. Just like what happened back with the Baptist minister back in 1850-ish. <clears throat> I think it was like 1853 or something. So anyway, he, he had he had a date. Convinced a lot of people, they were they were outstanding on the on the hilltops, wait dressed in white, waiting for Jesus to come. You know, probably baptismal robes or bed sheets or something, ready to go, ready to go. Um, and then it didn't happen. It was called the great great disappointment, I think. <laughs> anyway. So he went back and he recalculated, oh, I forgot to carry the two or something. <laughs> and he came back, oh, it'll be this year at such and such a time. And so they were convinced, oh, he just made a calculation error. He fixed it. Now we'll go out there and wait again. Guess what happened? Nothing. So and some of them, there was a disciple, what was her name, uh, the, the founder of the uh, Seventh-day Adventists. Anyway, she was absolutely convinced that he couldn't possibly be wrong. After all, he's a prophet inspired by the Holy Spirit. Jesus must have come secretly, just invisibly. He came and just nobody knows it. So she could not accept the idea that this preacher was wrong. And she had been so deceived. So she 
invented a doctrine. Ellen G. White, I believe, which is a found, she was the founder of the Adventists. So that, that this was like the, 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 they were waiting, and now actually Christ has come secretly, invisibly, and he's now doing some judgment deal. Whatever. So she makes all this stuff up, makes a bunch of her own doctrine up about do not eat this, do not think, no coffee, uh, shouldn't eat meat, uh, vegetables, fruits, uh, led to the creation of Kellogg and the breakfast cereal fad. Before that, people ate things like bacon and eggs and, and real food that you could get through the day on. Now she substituted a bowl full of starch. That'll get you to about 9 o'clock maybe, and then all of a sudden you get into the, uh, the uh, lack of sugar thing. Now, it does not have a lasting impact. But she was, uh, you know, all this hell stuff. And it's uh, one uh, eventually, uh, just recently, not too many years ago, a, uh, a Seventh-day Adventist minister was looking into her writings, and he discovered she was a complete fraud, plagiarist, liar, stole things from others as far as doctrines and visions and everything. She just got them from other people and just repeated them. Nothing new, nothing new, not unusual at all. Uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, another Christian myth. Now, we're waiting for the real, you know, Jesus was very clear. What did he say? See, this, this Ellen G. White, she did not believe the Scriptures. She was ignorant of the Scriptures, pretty much. What did Jesus say? Do not be deceived. If someone sells that 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 the Messiah, he, he's in the desert, or he's in the inner rooms, or... Do not believe them, for as the lightning flashes from the east to the west, so shall the Son of Man's coming be. Every eye shall see him. Not, he's not coming invisibly, not at all. People tell you he's coming secretly. They're not believing the Scripture. Oh, there's, he's got two comings. He's got a secret coming. He's got a visible where does, it, where does the Scripture teach that? It doesn't. So I want to show you another thing that's really commonly believed among evangelicals and fundamentalists and all kinds of deceived people. <clears throat> not that all evangelicals and fundamentalists are deceived. <laughs> that was not what I meant to say. It's just a lot of them. Um, now, is, amazingly, the, the, the cheap grace ones, the free gracers, the ones that are the absolute minimalist, uh, as far as just say, just believe, uh, mentally assent to something or say this prayer thing or that kind of thing, they don't, they don't have this issue. But a lot of others, like the Nazarenes, and many others do. I've heard it repeated all from all kinds of sources in all kinds of ways, including. Well, let's. I'll show you an example. Billy Graham's website. Well, actually, it's not his website anymore since he's not present. Have you ever noticed that on Facebook, it seems that the dead rise on Facebook? I get friends' requests from people I know are deceased. <laughs> In fact, one time I actually did uh, make a friend's request with a person who was deceased, and I was accepted. <laughs> I, I know why, but... It wasn't really the person whose name was on the account. It was his wife. But I, I, I find that so weird. I got a friend re uh, request from a dead uncle. <laughs> just a little bit. I just ignored it, I figured. I, I really, I didn't really like the guy anyway, so <laughs> why would I want to have be a friend with his ghost? Uh, you know, there's always these black sheep in the family. He was one of them. He was an adulterer. Yeah. And he divorced my aunt, which I liked. And my, he was my father's brother. Screwed my father over a lot of times. But family's family, you know.
Anyway, but I'm not going to make friends with with uh, with a with a dead uncle. I mean, like, no, like, you you know how that happens. But apparently, nothing ever dies on the internet. Enough humor. Uh, what I want to talk about is the myth of that you of this that you must repent of your sins and then believe in Christ or believe the gospel or something to be saved. Repent of your sins and then. That is definitely taught by the Nazarenes. Definitely. The uh, question is, how do you do that? How does a sinner do that? Well, they got a very high uh, opinion of what a sinner is able to do. But let's go over to Billy Graham's uh, page. This is, uh, oh, let's see, what's the name of it? Uh, BillyGraham.org about what we believe. This is their statement of faith. Now we could actually look at their at their at their uh, homepage, and you'll find a lot of everything but the gospel there. Well, let's do that for a second. This is this is what you see when you go to BillyGraham.org. Uh, the very title of the website should give you a clue to what it's about. It's not JesusChrist.org. Uh, so it's a little bit like John MacArthur. John MacArthur Inc. It's about John MacArthur. It's, you know, all his his web church, his church, his websites, his books are about they're really about John MacArthur's name. Now is John MacArthur Legacy Study Bible. Lovely. Put your name in the front of God's book. Study Bibles um, are junk anyway. How dare they mix their opinions with the Word of God? It's one thing to put some textual notes at the bottom, you know, to help you understand, give a little more insight into the original language. But uh, I, I. Learned to detest that stuff. I want to see what God says. I don't want to see the opinions of men. So apparently they're doing, uh, going to have an event at Milan. Are they going to evangelize? Does that look like a little bit like a Roman Catholic cathedral, Milan, Italy? So I, is he going to go over there and condemn all the Roman Catholics as unbelievers and call them to repent of the of their false doctrines? They're not. If it's a Billy Graham uh, organization, absolutely not. He used to platform Catholic bishops and apostate Protestants. Put him up on the platform with him. He was uh, promiscuous, very promiscuous. He would have spiritual intercourse with anybody. After all, you can't be particular. And uh, well now, where did I go? Oh, that just I somehow got that on that article. Uh, I don't want that. Anyway, so what's on this page here? What do you see? Uh, there's Franklin Graham. Scottish judge rules in favor of Franklin Graham religious freedom in Glasgow. Uh, this is a bunch of law enforcement couples fight for their marriages. Uh, let's see here. Vote, 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 vote. Oh man, you can't do any, you can't navigate on his page without activating the stuff. Uh, I, I've got it zoomed in. That, that's the problem here. Boy, his page is touchy. There's, there's some websites you can't do anything with without... Here we go. Here's, here's, what, here's what it is. So. Concerned about where our nature, nation is heading? Vote, 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 vote. So you're going to change the direction. So, so which, the godless Republicans or the godless Democrats? 
Satan also always offers multiple choice. You get his candidates. The old Soviet Union had elections. They'd have two-party candidates. The two-party system, the Communist Party and the Communist Party. You got which one of the two Communist Party candidates. Same thing in the United States, the, the Demo-Republican Party. The chimera, uh, the elephant with a donkey's head. Okay. <laughs> Can you imagine anybody that would use a jackass for their for their symbol? Uh I don't know. Why an elephant too? That's just dumb. Okay. Vote, 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 vote. That's not going to bring America to God at all. No. I uh, should Christians celebrate Halloween, reaping a harvest decades later. And Graham Lotz, it's time to pray. Um, pray for what? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So there's all these stories here, but none of them are about Jesus, the legacy of the gospel. Got it, got it. So um, this is, if you go to their manual, you'll find this website, or this uh, page here, What We Believe, their statement of faith. So uh, let's, I want to show you just one thing on here. I didn't want this to be about Billy Graham. So this is uh, the third thing, fourth thing on their statement of faith. The first three is about God and Christ, his deity, etc. Well, orthodox statement, a uh, little thin, but orthodox. So, but here's what he says about the gospel, or they say, the organization says. We believe that all men everywhere are lost and face the judgment of God. True. That Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. True. And that for sal and that for the salvation of lost and sinful men, repentance of sin. How often have you heard you must repent of your sin? And faith in Jesus Christ results in regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, we believe that God will reward the righteous with eternal life. Reward. A reward is something you get for doing something. It's not a free gift. <laughs> no, th this is anti-Christian. This statement here is anti-Christian. First, the sinner must repent of sin and faith and have faith in Jesus Christ, and that results in regeneration, the new birth. So you are you are saved by what you do. See, uh, the the magazine of the Billy Graham Association has all its decision. It's a decision you make. Come forward, make a decision to come forward, and I'll say a prayer with you, and then you can all count yourself as being saved. Uh, most of the people at those crusades that went forward are always Christians. <laughs> very few non-Christians and very few, and very few of the ones who went forward that weren't previously going to church ever started going to church. It's, you know, there's been some research into the actual results of those crusades and they're, they are pretty thin, let's put it that way. Uh, so, here, repentance of faith and faith in Jesus Christ, you have to do, you, there are things you do that results in regeneration. And furthermore, we believe that God will reward. In other words, God saves you because you repent of your sin and, and uh, conjure up faith in Jesus Christ. 
Furthermore, we believe that God will reward the righteous. That's the righteous. With eternal life in heaven. <laughs> uh, there's something profoundly unchristian about this. Profoundly. This is salvation by works. This is what the, uh, the easy believism people rightly protest against. Eternal life, heaven is a reward, right? For what you do. See, if it's a reward, it's, it's payment for what you've done. Or a prize for what you've done. You've won or you've earned it. Now, Billy Graham and Sons are, I believe, are all Southern Baptists. Got to be the member of the biggest Protestant denomination in the country. But also openly embrace the Roman Catholics. Got to have a large market to market your product to. I mean, it's not a terrible statement of faith, except, except for that. Except for that poison there. So let's look at the... Repent of sins. Does the Bible ever tell us to repent of our sins? And most people, of course it does. Of course it does. Of course it does. Where? See, I'm one of these foolish people that something will just strike me as, does the Bible actually say that? Yeah, I've heard it over and over and over and over again, but does the Bible actually say that? Does it? Well, we'll go see. We will take a look and see if the Bible actually tells us that we must repent of our sins to be saved. First of all, there's a problem here. How can a sinner, which is a person who practices sin, you know, a, a son of Adam, who is dead in trespasses and sins, who is at enmity to God, hostile toward God, totally absorbed in himself, because that's all he has in him. God is not there. He's a, 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 but supposed to be at the temple of God, but God isn't in the house. He, the only one in the house is he himself, his, his id and his ego and his super ego, according to Freud. So it's all you. You're worshiping yourself. You live your life in your self-interest. As psychologists properly say, about the children of Adam. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. Everything you do is done in self-interest, either in a bald sense or in a concealed sense. Unless you're born again. You do not have the capacity to do good in the sight of God. So let's go to... Uh, to the scripture, and I brought up Bible works here, and you can't see it on the screen, and I'm not going to adjust the screen to show you, but the, I did a search for, show me all the verses in the New Testament that include the word repent, or a variant of that, repenting, repentance, repented, you know, repent with a uh, asterisk after it to make it just use the start the stem any variant on that and sin with any variant so verse that contains those two words in some form and I've got a result here uh, let's see I got 36 verses and we're gonna go down the list starting with mark no Matthew. Matthew 16, 23 is the first occurrence. And he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. What? Sorry, somehow I got in the wrong search. That's what happens when you mess around. That, this is better. Okay, we've got 15 verses, 20 different forms of the words. <laughs> what? What? 
I don't have to tell jokes. I've never had to tell jokes. I never want to tell jokes. I'm I'm suitable to laugh at without that. Just enough nonsense. Here I'm thinking, what? How did that come up? Somebody started messing with the uh, the screen. Well, <laughs> you're live on video. Okay. Matthew nineteen, uh, Matthew nine thirteen, Matthew nine thirteen. But go and learn what this means. I desire. He's speaking to the Pharisees. I desire mercy, and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It doesn't say I come to call the sinners to repent of their sins. So the word sinners and repentance are here, or sin and repentance, but it doesn't say. He's come to call the sinners to repent of their sin. The word repent is a Greek word metanoia. It simply means change your mind or something like that. Change your attitude. Change what your, your, what your, your belief. Usually, it means change from believing you're righteous to believing you're a sinner. Often. Repenting of your self-righteousness. Repenting of your idea, of the idea that, well, God's okay with you. Or you're okay with God. That's, that's the biggest deception. That is the biggest deception. That's what people have to... You have to come to believe that you are truly a sinner. A subject to the wrath of God. That's what people don't want to believe. They hide from that. They hide from God. They, 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 they don't want that in their mind, so they suppress that. They suppress the knowledge that they are at enmity, at war with God. Hostile toward God. Under his wrath, under his judgment, because they have not just sinned, but they are sinners by nature. They are always hostile toward God. They can't do anything else. That's what they are. So he said, I've come to call sinners to repentance. Repentance is, is, is to, to agree with God that you're a sinner and that you're subject to his judgment and you're going to go to hell. And you deserve it. You richly deserve that punishment. It comes from the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's not something you do. It's something God does in you. He convicts you of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Unless the Holy Spirit does that, you will not come to Christ. Not for the right reason, not to be saved. You'll come to Christ to be given things. You'll come to Christ to get healed or to have a better marriage. Or I want the, all about you. Say, that is about you. I want this. I want that. I'd like this. I want that. I want to know what I'm supposed to do with my life. That kind of stuff. That is nothing to do with the gospel. That is, you have to come to God to get be saved from your sin and from the judgment of God, from the wrath of God, the punishment that your sin deserves, which is death. Being cut, you've already cut off from God. So you want to spend eternity cut off from God? So this is not calling sinners to repent of their sin. It's calling them repentance. It changed their mind about themselves and about God. They deceive themselves by thinking they're okay. Even though they know they're not. They just tell themselves that over and over again put it out of their mind. Every time something reminds them that they're not right with God, they put it out of their mind. That's what you have to repent of. You have to be granted that. Mark 1, 4. John came baptizing, this is John the Baptist, in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Actually, it's into the remission of sins. Bad translation. 
into the remission of sins. Why? The word there is ice. It literally means into. It can mean for the purpose of, sort of indirectly, because it's into. But what you have to realize, what was, uh, what was John preaching? He was preaching not himself, not repentance per se, but to believe in the coming Messiah. Because believing in repenting of your self-righteousness, which was a big sin of the Jews, and believing in the coming one that was the replacement for Moses, that Moses spoke of, one that would come uh, that was greater than Moses. See, the law can't save you from your sin. The law just tells you you're damned because of your sin. Moses wrote of him, the prophets prophesied here, him, and, and uh, John said he was the forerunner. He was the one who's the voice crying in the wilderness announcing the coming of the Messiah who would save Israel, who would save God's people. So it was repentance of your self-righteousness and realizing that you need to be saved, that God must save you, and announcing that he was coming. So it was repentance into the remission of sins, which is in Jesus Christ, only in Jesus. We are saved in Christ by, by him, what he would do. He had to come and die on that cross. There is no remission of sins apart from that. And believing in him and what he, for us, did. For them as he who would come and save. They knew the promises of the new covenant. They knew Isaiah 53. So they were being baptized, as Paul says to some disciples of John, baptized into him who was coming. That is Jesus Christ, baptized with water. But John said, the one who will come will baptize you, not with water, but with spirit, with the spirit and in fire. Water was ritual cleansing, but not thoroughly. It comes from the law. Different video. Next verse. So he's not saying repent of your sins. Say, the, repent of your, your self-righteousness. I mean, who, who, he, he, he excoriated the, uh, the Pharisees who came to him and others who thought they were righteous. But sinners and prostitutes, tax collectors, believed John. And when Christ came, they believed in him. Mark chapter 2, verse 17 then Jesus heard it and said to them, Those who are well do not need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Yeah, you think you're righteous. Uh, I didn't come for you. I came for those who know they're sinners, who are looking for the solution to their dilemma, that they have fallen short of the glory of God and are under the sentence of death as rebels against him. Those people, how can a sinful person be reconciled to the most holy God? That's the issue. That's why you have to have a divine Savior. You can't possibly save yourself, ever. No way. You'll never meet God's standard. You've already, you're already a rebel. How are you going to atone for that? You can't. That does not say repent of your sins. Again, we're looking for a passage that says repent of your sins in some form. He went uh, Then he went into all the region around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Again, the uh, word here is into the remission of sins. And into is in the sense of into Christ. That is, that is John the Baptist there. 
He was announcing the coming of the Messiah. So being baptized into the remission of sins was into the coming one, into the Savior. They were looking for the Messiah who would come and save them from their sins. He was not preaching, you go get rid of all your sins and then God will accept you. No. Into the remission of sins. Because it's looking toward the Messiah. Luke 5.32 I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We've already dealt with that one in a different gospel. Yeah, it was uh, sinners who know they're sinners, convicted by the Holy Spirit. And then what? who does the Holy Spirit send you? Does the Holy Spirit of God tell you to clean up your life and then come to Christ? Now that old song we sang is true. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Luke 15, 7, I say unto you that likewise uh, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons who have no need of repentance. Over one sinner who comes to Christ for salvation. Not repenting of their sins to make themselves righteous, which is entirely impossible. So why do we keep hearing, repent of your sins and believe in Christ? It's a myth. The Bible doesn't say that. We're halfway through. Luke 15, 10. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. It doesn't say repenteth of their sins. Repentance is change your mind. Metanoia. Meta, change, noia, mind. Luke 17, 3. Take heed to yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. So in this case, this is personal, so it doesn't really even apply. This is not about salvation. Um, if he changes it, well, again, it's change of mind, change of. So is what does it mean when you're when you're somebody changes their mind about uh, sinning against you? Actually, here, rebuke him. If he stops doing that, if he repents of what he did to you and stops doing it, forgive him. It has nothing to do with, uh, with, with salvation, though. Uh, and then if he sins against you seven times a day, seven times a day return, a turn, returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. This is about what we are supposed to do. Luke 24, 47. And that repentance and the remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Repentance. Repentance, that is turning toward God. Turning away from your, your self-righteousness, recognizing you know, that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. It's realizing the truth about ourselves, seeing ourselves as we truly are through the, the work of the Holy Spirit. We don't do it naturally. We, we conceal this self from it. We blind our eyes to this because it makes us very uncomfortable. So uh, the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to see our true condition and then 
you know, we change our mind about that we're okay with God and realize we're not. And we realize a need, you know, if, even as a sinner, we can cry out to God, save me, oh God, out of self-interest because we see that we are subject to, to God's judgment and under his condemnation, which we richly deserve, and will end up in hell, which we richly deserve. See, as long as you think you don't deserve that, you haven't really changed your mind to accord with the truth. It has to do with repenting of your, your self-deceit and believing the truth. Acts. 238. Now we're getting into the new te into the uh, the true period of the gospel, the, the age of grace here, where the gospel has come into force. The new covenant is in force. Begins at Pentecost here, and what does? What, first of all, they they said. Let me go up one verse to give a little context here. Now, when they heard this, well, what did they hear? Let's go up another verse. This is Peter preaching. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He was. This is the Messiah. This is the promised one. This is God with us, Emmanuel. And you crucified him. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Convicted by the Spirit of God. I mean, this is the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost. And said to Peter and the rest of the, brother, uh, rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Realizing their condition is God had sent the Messiah and they crucified him. The Holy Spirit opened their eyes with the pre preaching of Peter and his conviction of their sin to realize what they had done. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for, again, into the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is one of the promises of the new covenant. They've been waiting for this. God had promised to make a new covenant. Not like the covenant of Moses. Which is another video. I'm trying to keep them down to less than two hours. So this is, he's telling them to repent of their self-righteousness, because that was the basic religion of the Jews, thinking they were right by because they were Jews and because they kept the law or tried to keep the law. They kept a watered-down version of the law. Jesus, like in the Sermon on the Mount, what he is doing is restoring the power of the law to condemn you. Because they had wa uh, watered it down to, to convince themselves that they were fine with God. Jews today, same thing. They basically ignore the law. They have to, because they can't keep it. They can't possibly keep the law of Moses. No way. There's some things missing, like a temple to offer the animal sacrifices in. No, they replaced it with the teachings of their rabbis, which didn't believe the Bible anyway. It's a system of false religion that convinces you you're right with God when you're not. It convinces you that you're better than the rest of the world when you're not. They believed a lie. And in Jesus' day, you had the Pharisees and others who thought they were righteous. They were the, the holiness people. They were the, the Puritans of their day. They were serious about their religion. They were serious about the Bible. They just mutilated it, though, in their sinfulness. It's 
So here we see that that the Holy Spirit has convicted them of their sin of crucifying their their Messiah, who they've been waiting for, and they're crying out, "What shall we do?" They know what they've done. Repent, change your mind. Believe that he is the Messiah. See, they had re the people he's talking to basically are the ones who re who rejected Jesus as the Messiah. They had not believed that he was. They knew what the law said. They knew what Moses said about the Messiah. That everyone that does not hear him will be cut off from God, from, from God's people. They knew this. Peter just said, you have crucified your Messiah. And Peter's remedy is, change your mind. Believe that he is the Messiah. And be baptized in his name. What? Identify yourself as a follower of him. That's what baptism is. It's not some magic water. It is confessing that you're a sinner and you need to be saved and become a, one of God's people. I could do an entire video on that, too. A, a Jewish conversion, that's... Everybody was baptized. But there's a lot of things that the church forgot, especially when it became almost all Gentile. They had no knowledge of Jewish culture and Jewish religion, basically. That's why a lot of things are screwed up. And most of them weren't regenerate. That doesn't help. So he's saying, repent of your unbelief, believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and be baptized in his name. Same thing in, in uh, Mark, or Mark, Romans chapter 10. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. That's the proof that he is the Messiah, the proof given to all men. And in your heart, not just in your head, your heart, you truly believe it. And confess with your mouth, being baptized into the name of Jesus was confessing Jesus. You said, I'm, I'm no longer following Moses. I'm following the one that Moses spoke of, the Messiah, who is Jesus. I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He's the one that God sent to save Israel from its sin and from the judgment of God. This is not put away your sins. Not repent of your sins. Repent of your unbelief. John 3, 36. Everyone who does not believe, who disbelieves the wrath of God, abides on him. And again, the gift of the Holy Spirit is one of the promises of the new covenant. They knew it. They knew it. You know, that's the New Covenant is almost never preached in churches. I don't know if I've ever heard a sermon on it. I don't have the best memory in the world, but I certainly can't remember one. One doesn't come to mind. Okay, that doesn't say repent of your sins. Acts 3.19, repent therefore and be converted. Change your, turn around, change your direction and your sins will be blotted out. Repentance, what? That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, the new covenant, uh, his blessing, his, his spirit. Repent from your unbelief. Your, they were be not believing that Jesus was the Christ. Because your sins can't be blotted out except through faith in him. He's, uh, this is uh, 
Peter again preaching to the same, same thing. He's saying, you denied the Holy One and asked for a murder to be granted to you. So he's preaching to the Jewish audience in Jerusalem again and saying, repent and believe in Christ that he may send Jesus Christ uh, who was preached to you before. In other words, Christ would come back. Whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Then he talks about Moses. Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord our God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul that does not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Believe on Christ. And your sins will be blotted out. Doesn't say be right with God by putting away your sins before you believe in him. That's ridiculous. That's impossible. Acts 5.31 The Lord, uh, him God has exalted to his right hand. Who's preaching? Probably Peter again. Yeah, he's, basically, Peter's giving his same, this is Peter's uh, sermon, repeated over and over again. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey, he's speaking to the Jewish leadership. We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree, nailing him to the cross. Him, God has exalted to his right hand to be prince, ruler, and savior. To give repentance to Israel. To give repentance to Israel. And the forgiveness of sins. So repentance is a gift of God. Conviction of the Holy Spirit is a gift of God. The, the idea that you change your mind about yourself and God. And what you really are. And the circumstance you're really in. It's being convicted of your sinfulness and God's justice and holiness and the fact that you deserve hell. I mean, not, you really, truly deserve it. Because you do. You really do. But people don't want to believe that. Let me look here. Second Corinthians twelve twenty one. Paul speaking, writing to the Corinthians, lest uh, when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of uncleanness, fornication, and lewdness, which they have practiced. See, again, repentance is a gift of God. So is faith, really. So th there were people in Corinth that were living like unbelievers, but calling themselves Christians. Probably believing they were Christians. Engaging in gross sins, sinful lifestyles. Adulterers. Uh, one man uh, was uh, sleeping with his... Uh, his mother, or probably stepmother, something like that. And the church was fine with it. And the point is that if you truly are saved, if you truly are born again, you don't love sin, you don't continue in it constantly. You cannot live a sinful, manifestly sinful, wicked life and truly be a Christian. You can't. You may stumble, but you hate it. You don't love your sin. You, you despise it. When you fail, you are immediately smitten, and you go, oh, God, why did I do that? Why? Because sin dwells in our mortal body, and it catches us sometimes unaware. You know, something happens, and we uh, snap at our wives or something because we're distracted, we're occupied, and, you know, I, 
I can do that if I'm driving and she thinks I'm not seeing something. I'm trying to look at the traffic and and she'll make some comment. <laughs> you know, you have two drivers in the front seats. That's the problem. And I'll because I'm trying to see the traffic. I've like I remember I'm remembering a particular incident where I, I snapped at her. Cause she was interfering with me with trying to watch the traffic by being concerned about me watching the traffic. And I was immediately, oh, man. And I had to apologize later. It just, I, the Holy Spirit would not let me alone. I knew I, I've got to apologize for her. She didn't do any wrong. I did wrong. I mean, I could justify it because, but that's not the point. She didn't deserve me snapping at her. That was my flesh. That was my sinful flesh. But a sinner doesn't have that problem. I mean, they, they're not convicted of their sin. They're, they're not. They're just like, they justify themselves. She had it coming. See, it, it has to do with the truth. A lot of it has to do with loving the truth, which is a gift of God, too. Something received, the love of the truth. Because you see what you really did, and you know what's wrong. And you know she didn't deserve what you did. She was trying to do good. That's why she didn't deserve it. That's different. There are people who call themselves Christians. Their lives manifest the fact they're not. It's a different thing that are deceived, they don't have the truth, the love of the truth. They deceive themselves by the fact that I'm a Christian because I go to church. I'm a Christian because I, I, I say a prayer. I'm a Christian because I did this. I got baptized, therefore I'm a Christian. So I'm going to heaven. doesn't matter how I live. No, if God is in you, if God has changed your heart, you won't want to live wicked. If you do want to live a wicked, sinful lifestyle, it manifests the fact that you have not been saved. God hasn't done his work in you. Because salvation is not something you do, it's something God does. And that's what we have going on here. People in the church who manifestly haven't been changed by God, haven't been born again. Hebrews 6, 6, last verse. If they fall to renew them again to repentance, it is impossible. That's, let me go up a verse. Verse 4, For it is impossible for those who have been once enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for uh, for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Uh, what, what was going on in uh, Hebrews is the Jewish community, the unbelieving Jews, were pressuring the believing Jews to return to Moses and to the law. That was the temptation, a social pressure, especially. Uh, and what the, the sin that's spoken of here is leaving Christ, renouncing Christ, and going back to Moses. And the writer of Hebrews is warning against that. So if they have come to the knowledge of Christ, if they've come to faith, if they have become a partaker of the Holy Spirit, and then reject that and go back to Moses, it's impossible to renew them to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. They have, they have rejected God's Savior, his salvation, due to pressure or whatever and gone back to the law. There's no salvation there. They've rejected the only salvation there is. And since repentance is a gift of God, and you have rejected 
what God calls you to repent to, it's impossible. When I was in Israel, I met a, uh, a Jewish rabbi, ultra-Orthodox rabbi, that had been an American Pentecostal. Um, and I debated him. I had a, a sort of a running debate with him. He was there trying to convert, make proselytes among some tourists, young tourists. And I had a sort of a running debate. I'd ask him questions. He got really angry with me because I kept using the Old Testament to preach Jesus Christ. I wasn't a preacher. I was just a young guy and that happened to be saved. And here's a man who said, he, said, he told me, I, I, was a, I did speak in tongues. I was a Pentecostal or whatever. And he, re, he renounced all that. Is that what the writer here is talking about? Having tasted of the, the Holy Spirit. Of course, the spirit that works among Pentecostals is not really the Holy Spirit. But see, to, to have rejected the Messiah and, and, and renounced that and gone back to Moses, which is exactly what he did. It's, not, it's really not about speaking in tongues. It's rejecting Christ. Having uh, been once enlightened to the fact that Jesus was the Messiah and apparently believing that, and then renouncing that and going back to the law and to Moses, the writer here is saying it's impossible to renew them, it's sort of like the, the unpardonable sin, because they, if they were convicted by the Holy Spirit and believed the gospel and they reject that, they reject what the Holy Spirit had convicted them of the truth of, they're not going to receive that again. They've already rejected the work of God that God has done in them. And, well, having done that, how how do you how can you repent again? You basically crucify you you put yourself with those who nailed him to the cross. You were you were like Judas. You were a believer, but then you decided to sell out and aid those that crucified him. This is not about repenting of sins. This is about not departing from Christ. So there is no passage in the New Testament that uh, talks, that I've ever been able to find, that talks of putting away your sins that that's in order to be saved. But what is, what does the New Testament teach, in fact? Back to Romans 10. Again, I have to keep repeating this to, to drill it into people. Drill it in. For you know, read the entire book of Hebrews, but there's we're going to the summary about, you know, it, it Paul, his theme is we're saved by grace, not by works. And in this whole section of Romans 1 through 10 here, and then continues on in 11, he is hammering on this thing, and here he's talking about the Jews that don't believe. I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, especially the Pharisees. He's a, he was a Pharisee. But not in accordance with knowledge. Knowledge of the truth. And not knowing about God's righteousness, that God has prepared a righteousness for us. That's his workmanship, not ours. That righteousness is Christ. It's a righteousness that's given to us. It doesn't belong to us. We didn't make it. God made it for us in Christ. We're given his righteousness. And seeking to establish their own through works, through obedience to the law, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Instead of looking to God to to make them righteous through giving them a righteousness that they didn't work for. They try to, to earn it by keeping the law. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. In other words, the law, 
the law as a way to be right with God ended because Christ came. It never was truly a way to righteousness because nobody ever kept it except Christ. For Christ is the end so, but to, of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. All that believe in Christ put away the law. They don't try to be right with God by keeping the commandments. They, they know they are right with God by trusting in Christ. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. In other words, if you keep all the commandments all the time, God will bless you. Uh, Christ did that, and he has those blessings. And those who are in him have those blessings too, not based on our works, but his. But the righteousness, based, you know, the, the blessings of the law, they belong to Christ. He earned them. Those who are in Christ have them because we're in him. We didn't do it. We didn't earn it. He did. The righteousness based on faith speaks thus. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will ascend into the abyss to bring Christ up. In other words, he's saying that, that the one who's based on faith, trusting in God, does not say, what will I do to be right with God? What will I do to be saved? But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. This is the word of faith that they're preaching right now. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, Jesus is Lord, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, we're justified by faith alone. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So he says there's two things here. One is believing what Christ did, and the other is adhering yourself to Christ. This is really where baptism fits in. But Paul doesn't mention baptism, strictly speaking, is not necessary. Faith is necessary. But what he's saying here is, first you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and he did what he says he does, does that those who believe in him are right with God and have eternal life. And then you identify with it, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Or Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, he is Lord, which is a statement of deity, too, and a, a statement of his authority. I mean, those that say that you don't, you, you don't make Christ Lord, of course you don't make Christ Lord, he is Lord. You bow to him. You recognize his authority. You identify yourself with him. I'm a believer in you, Lord Jesus. Do with me as you please. Your Lord, not me. You submit yourself to the Lord. You identify yourself with the Lord. That's what Paul's saying here. You got to believe the gospel. You got to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and he rose, was risen from the dead. And you got to identify yourself with him. However you want to fit, you got to follow him, whatever. If you say, yeah, I believe he's the Messiah, but there's no way I'm going to submit to him, what are you? You're an unregenerate rebel. God hasn't changed your heart. You're still in rebellion. And you say, I'm not going to let God mess with my life. I love my sin. You're not going to mess with my life. Well, what happens to you? God throws you into hell. Because you're worse than the person who never heard the gospel. You've heard about the Savior. You know what he's did for you. You believed he was risen from the dead, and yet you reject his authority over you. 
your punishment would be far worse than a person simply ignorant of the gospel. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Or actually, this is an into also, I believe. This is one of those into things, ice. Yes, it's ice. So, um, so you re into justification and into salvation. The resulting in, that's just the New American Standard there. I don't know how you got a New American Standard. but Be Why? Because it's into Christ. Justification and salvation are all in Christ. If you're not in Christ, so if you believe who he is, but you don't accept him as your, as your Savior and your Lord, you don't identify yourself with him, not with something he did, but him, him, he himself. Uh, because salvation is in him. If you're not in him, you're not saved. If you reject his authority over you, you're not saved. <laughs> you're still, you say, I'm, I'm going to be a rebel still. T t yeah, the worst, I can't think of much worse than to recognize who he is and then give him the finger. Because that's what they're doing. Oh, I don't have to accept Jesus as Lord to be saved. I don't have to recognize his authority over my life. Scripture says if I merely believe. So I, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to be saved of my sin. Well, you wouldn't want to be in heaven. You would, you would jump. You would run screaming into hell because heaven would be worse than hell for you. There's fire in heaven, too. Did you know that? The, the sea of glass mixed with fire. It's before the throne. Fire is God's holiness. God's cleansing fire. Sinners don't want to be cleansed. No, it's really... And the, in hell and heaven, it's both God, it's God's presence, God's holiness is really, I think, what's being re represented there. And in heaven, those who have been saved by God and cleansed by God and perfected by God, we can abide in the midst of God's holiness. But sinners, when you stand in the presence of the holy God, uh, Christ and his holy angels, in hell... That fire, that holiness of God, is a torment. Because you're not holy. A flaming torment. Because it reveals your wickedness. And you can't block it out of your mind. You are tormented by what you are and how holy God is and the fact that you rejected him. And you can never get away from that because you've rejected salvation. There is no possibility of repentance in hell because you rejected it. So you go into hell as a sinner and you abide forever as a sinner under the wrath of God because you cannot repent because you would not repent. You refused it. <sighs> Bad situation. So there is no verse in the New Testament, or anywhere in the Bible I know, that says repent of your sins. That's just a myth. That is a myth. All right, so I'm going to end it there. I could go, I'd like to go on to the New Covenant, but I think I'll have to do a separate video. It's, a, it's already an hour and 15 minutes. So uh, that's one of, so I, I guess this has been a Mythbusters episode. For Christianity, the myth of repenting of your sins in order to be saved. Don't let anybody tell you that, because it's really common among Christians, and it's not biblical. You should not believe such things. Not true. 
not true. 